and be trained at the beginning of, of a semester and continue to go into the prisons with us thereafter. So I'm, I'm honored uh, to get to help to host this event, but I'm also honored on a personal level because all of you are coming here to think about what the arts can do in the lives of, of currently and formerly incarcerated people. My father did 20 years in Texas and there was really nothing going on at the prison where he was in the middle of nowhere, West Texas. And so to know that there are so many of you who actually want to take arts programming to the people who appreciate it most uh, means a great deal to me. And I'm so grateful that you all would come together and share this, this work and this moment with all of us. And now I'm gonna ask the panelists to please introduce themselves and tell us about your own connections to the criminal justice system. Hi, my name is Jason Smith and I work for the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency, or MCCD for short. MCCD is a nonprofit uh, that does statewide juvenile justice and criminal justice advocacy work. I focus on juvenile justice. Um, all of my professional career has been in the field of juvenile justice, first in the direct uh, social work field and now um, in the practice of macro level policy work, which I've always was interested in doing. And so my main focus is to reduce uh, the number of young people entering uh, in, in facilities, whether it's detentions or long-term residential placements, and also reduce the number of young people entering the adult system, which I can talk more about today. So thank you for having me. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Alea Harvey Quinn. I am from Detroit. Um, I did youth work in Detroit since 2002, um, mostly working at the intersections of youth entrepreneurship, um, arts education, and social justice education. Um, I saw a number of those youth transition into um, really difficult situations in which they were impacted by violence or incarceration. Um, and I am now doing anti-criminalization, criminal justice reform, and anti-violence work in Detroit in affiliation with the PICO National Network's Live Free campaign. Um, I'm also a directly impacted person as my father was in prison for 27 years and it is mostly from that lens that I will speak. Hi everybody. It's so nice to see all your smiling faces. I am a formerly incarcerated person. I went in um, when I was very young and that was right after the end of the Vietnam War. The war had just ended uh, when I went to the Detroit House of Corrections and I didn't come home until 2002. And during that time, I and many, many of us fought for the right to humane treatment and for the right to have constitutionally uh, protected access to the courts and access to educational and vocational training programs. And out of that effort, PCAP was born when we opened the door and Buzz walked in. And then Janie came and we have the art show now, the beautiful, beautiful art show. It's spectacular this year. And, and so it's been the great joy of my life to come home. I've been home 15 years and be able to work with PCAP and be able to share knowledge from the inside and to help convene and plan events like today. And I'm so happy you're here. I won't give you germs. Hi, um, so I'm here wearing a couple of different hats. I am, for starters, Ashley and Mary's colleague here at the University of Michigan in the Residential College in African American Studies and in History. Uh, I'm a historian. I write about uh, incarceration, both uh, in terms of writing books. I wrote a book on the Attica prison uprising of 1971. And uh, I also write popularly on that, meaning for the New York Times, the Atlantic, anyone who will listen to me, uh, mostly about prisoner rights, mostly about um, the collateral consequences of incarceration. And I guess the third hat I wear is that I come at this from a policy point of view. I do a lot of work in Washington and around the country 
uh, talking to impacted folks and then trying to translate that to uh, in congressional staff briefings, uh, on various study panels, and, um, and, and also just using that perch as an opportunity to go inside as often as I can and see what some of the most incredible uh, ideas are coming from inside, outside. Um, for example, I recently got to spend an entire day inside of San Quentin working uh, to really learn what the uh, folks inside who are journalists and uh, who are writers uh, have to tell us about what they need to come home and what they need on the inside. And so I guess I'm here in multiple capacities, but, uh, but more than anything, here to listen and learn. Thank you. All right, great. I'll jump right into it. All right, great. Um, my name is Sam Marvin. Sorry for being late, coming over from uh, Detroit. Always forget how hard it is to find parking here. Um, so I'm a project manager in the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development uh, for the City of Detroit. Uh, my connection to criminal justice is through uh, the management of workforce reentry programs that we operate uh, for the benefit of individuals returning to Detroit from incarceration. So uh, that took the form of stepping up what we called one stops. Uh, one stop um, American Job Centers is now the, the lingo according to WIOA. That's our federal funding source. Um, so we brought workforce development activities into two um, Department of Corrections facilities uh, for Detroiters, and that it also included some vocational job training. Uh, and then we continue to support them post-release uh, through uh, supportive services, through um, job placement, and most recently, um, temporary work experiences, something that we're, that we're doing, um, trying to uh, reduce the barriers to employment faced by uh, the individuals that we're serving. So I've been in this role for um, about a year and a half, so there's still a lot to learn, and so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the other panelists, and um, thank you for having me. Again, sorry for being late. It's a wonderful lineup of people that we've got here, and I, I know that you'll have very insightful answers to the broad series of questions that I'm going to ask you over the course of this panel. So one of the topics uh, that we had as a discussion table earlier and that we'll have again after this panel is about expungement. So for those of you who don't know, expungement refers to the clearing of one's record after you've had uh, a conviction. And this can happen for uh, people who were wrongfully convicted can have their records expunged later on, people who had sort of minor crimes, and we hope that their records would not affect them for the rest of their lives. Expungement could be a possibility in a very small minority of cases. And uh, expungement could also happen for juveniles uh, whose records could be sealed, but sometimes aren't sealed as well as they should be, uh, or could be cleared depending on the court processes that will, that might or might not help them. But expungement is a very thorny issue and a very difficult topic. So what I wanted to ask the panel is why is expungement so difficult? And what might we do to support efforts to clear people's records so that they'd have a, an easier time with things like housing and job placement? And anyone who feels called to answer can begin the conversation. Expungement is used in a very limited number of cases, and that's because in order to have a, your record expunged, you have to be a first-time offender, which means you only have one conviction. So if you had multiples on one day or any other circumstances, you're not eligible. You're not eligible if you have been convicted of a capital offense. So if it's rape, robbery, murder, use your imagination, um, anything like that, um, they absolutely will not expunge. The folks that I knew that were expunged were people that were actually factually innocent and were dismissed out of court and discharged but it still did not deal with their rap sheet. So if you can somehow get past the expungement situation, that rap sheet will follow you quicker than a cat that wants tuna. Um, I, I would just like to say about that, I think that this question, it, it's important that every, every location, every state, every city has different, a different situation going on, on with expungement. And I can just speak for a minute about my experience with it, which illuminated for me the problems with it, which were everything that Mary said. But in addition, the case that I was most directly involved in was somebody who was uh, accused of a crime. Ultimately, the, they were, it was thrown out. There was no evidence. The whole thing was thrown out. And nevertheless, he had a record. 
and the record was automatically entered into the, uh, the database. And the barrier in that case was simply, the, the, you have to be the one to initiate it, number one. It's not automatic. So there needs to be, as a solution, there has to be an automatic policy trigger for expungement. That's the first thing. I mean, that's really a, a concrete policy solution. But in addition to that, there's a technological problem, which is that once you're in the system, on, for any reason, even if it is expunged, there's no obligation to get it out of the system where it used to be. And so in this day of technology, uh, we have an additional barrier, which is even if the law says you have to do it, or even if you're successful in doing it, in, the case, in my case, this was Philadelphia with a family member, and we got the um, public defender's office to initiate the expungement on behalf of this guy. Um, but even then, it was just always catch as catch can whether this would come up in the system, if he was applying for a job, if he was applying for certain things. And because there's such a vast system, you could never predict when it was going to come up. So I think that it's both a question of, you know, you shouldn't have to be the one that initiates it. If that's, if, if you, if you can get expungement, it should be automatic, and then there has to be the technological piece of making sure that it actually is there, even if you get it. Um, wanted to add that in the juvenile system, at least, well, at least here in Michigan, um, one benefit of it is, uh, there, though the struggle still exists with expungement and though your record can be sealed, it's not completely sealed to, for certain aspects. Um, we have a, a range of opportunities for diversion, um, I, which what I think is a bit more than what exists on the, the adult side. They're, in the, uh, the juvenile side, they have informal consent calendars that uh, cases can be transferred to um, and handled by the court informally before the formal adjudication process. Um, but there also are a wide range of diversion programs that stop a case before they even enter the, uh, at the prosecutorial level, when the petition is first uh, submitted to the court. Those cases are often uh, maintained in confidential, non-public case files, um, and their, their case record is destroyed when the kid turns 18. Um, but those are only for cases when a young person is diverted from formal adjudication, which is the equivalent of a conviction, not completely, which it benefits uh, employment down the road, but for kids that are not adjudicated formally in the justice system. It, they have the opportunity to have their case dismissed without having a formal public record. And that can and cannot be true sometimes for adults as well. We uh, have seen a number of, of students and volunteers at the University of Michigan who uh, want to volunteer with us in the prisons and we can't get them through the background check stage with the MDOC in order to enable them to enter the prisons to volunteer. And many of those folks didn't realize that they had an active criminal record because they got caught up in a minor drug charge, somebody gets caught smoking pot or something like this, a first time offense, and they go through a court adjudication process for first time offenders where if you successfully complete a program through the court, you're not supposed to have a record. And yet, when we go to run their background checks, their record still comes up. So the, um, and the students had no idea that it was still there until they tried to volunteer with us and were unsuccessful. So as Heather says, if you don't initiate the process of expungement, and sometimes even if you do, those things will linger on your record and affect the rest of your life without you even being aware of it until you're in a high stakes situation where you're trying to get something that you need. So this conversation I think has to be proactive. Did anybody else want to comment? Uh, I'm tangential to uh, expungements in our office, um, but I, from my observations, uh, one, of the, one of the big barriers, um, especially in Michigan, are the limited eligibility criteria for expungements, uh, combined, just from an offense standpoint, combined with the number of years that one must be post-adjudication or post-release from incarceration, it's very hard to touch some of those individuals. So communication and then identifying who is eligible. So it's a, it's a data question. And if you have, um, because it's both misdemeanors and felonies, sometimes uh, you have multiple jurisdictions that will have those records. So if you are one overarching uh, or if you want to set up an overarching system to affect, say, everybody in the city of Detroit, you have to also loop in Oakland County, Macomb County, other out counties, um, because individuals have those offenses. I know just from our, from our own program, we can have um, individuals who might be coming back to Detroit, but they were, had they con convictions in Oakland County from 10 years ago and whatnot. So there's a question of gathering all the right data and then identifying the individuals and then actually 
communicating them, communicating with them in a way that they buy into the process because it's time consuming for some of them because of the, the time involved. They, they are revisiting old wounds. Uh, that's not something that everybody necessarily wants to do. So um, it's a tough nut to crack and I think if we can loosen up some of the eligibility criteria that would allow people to initiate maybe more so on their own uh, to make it easier for uh, the folks sitting near me to, uh, to hit the goal of expungements that they, that they have. Just to follow up on that, I think that that just that hearing that just underscores to me we've we've spent a lot of very productive attention on this question of uh, when folks come home, what are the barriers to employment? What are the barriers to uh, coming to the University of Michigan or any number of uh, barriers? But we rarely talk about expungement. We rarely talk about the way in which this pops up um, in your record, even if it's they have no legal basis to keep it there. And so I do think, I mean, I'm really grateful that you're bringing this up because it's not something that actually, uh, from certainly on criminal justice reform panels, I've never actually been on a panel where this, this topic has come up. And I, I'm striking me how important this is, particularly technologically and jurisdictionally. Like, it can come up and you least expect it. And, and as you say, that's a more vital issue in the world that we live in today that is so electronically controlled. People who came home in the 70s didn't have this problem in the same way. If you moved to a different state and nobody knew you, you could start over. And they wouldn't be able to track your record down, but now it will follow you wherever you go. Uh, so thank you for, for your comments on that really important issue. A related issue that comes up a whole lot in these conversations is how do we get people ready when they're about to come home from prison for today's job market? And how do we support the folks who have come home? Uh, somebody was saying on the morning panel that uh, something like 67% of people on parole are in the state of Michigan are without full-time employment. That's something that we need to fix immediately. And unfortunately, many job programs in prisons in the past have been preparing people for jobs that don't exist or giving them training that they are then not eligible to be certified or licensed in a particular career path. So what, what is happening now as we get people ready to come home and right after they've come home? And what can we do better? OK, I'll uh, jump in here. Um, so it, I think it's actually 75% unemployment among uh, the pop that's the population that's under supervision from MDOC. Uh, that number might be a little uh, lower um, it's, um, since I heard it last from from their voices. Anybody from MDOC here, by the way? Okay. Um, so there are a couple of barriers. The first is just uh, vocational vo vocational skills, the, the actual hard skills. Um, so yes, you have to prepare people for the jobs that they're gonna come back to. Um, and you find sometimes there are well-meaning well programs that prepare people for jobs uh, in industries that are not necessarily background friendly or background friendly yet. So you have to avoid that pitfall. So the way to do that is to engage employers uh, at the beginning, to understand where are where is there a talent gap? Um, where do you need individuals? Where can where can right now we put people to work if they have, let's say, eight months of training on a CNC machine? Uh, and so if anybody here has toured the vocational villages uh, that MDOC has set up, um, you'll notice that there's uh, a lot of employer buy-in. I've toured the facilities multiple times. I'm always there with employers. I'm always there with HR and uh, representatives. Um, if you look at the individuals that are coming back, I think in, the, in Wayne County, um, the individuals that are currently under parole supervision had a 78% unemployment rate before they were incarcerated. So these are, these are individuals who do not have a history of employment. So they, um, they come back and they've received this, this upskilling inside of the prison if they were lucky enough to get one of the training slots that's available. And they come back and they, are, they, they interview. And because they've received interview preparation uh, before they're released, they, they get the job. The employer has already been primed. They know that this individual has a background. They're willing to give them a second chance. And then the individual, the, the individual uh, shows up, and they don't have the soft skills uh, to, to make it work. They, they have never held a job before. When you're in prison, it's a very structured environment. It's very easy to, um, it's very, I should say, it's very hard to not, uh, not show up on time. Um, you're the, 
the preparation that you have to, there's no way to prepare for that except to have that experience. And so one of the things that, we're, that I'm really leaning into, and I'm glad to see uh, Rishi in the back from, uh, from Greenlight, is uh, an approach called temporary work experiences or transitional jobs, where you put somebody in a job where they can learn the soft skills, um, they can have uh, a source of income, a stabilization in their life, and then move on from that to additional hard skill training or um, placement into a full-time into, into a full-time job once that very, very crucial period of initial reentry is complete, then they can move into the, the full-time job. In our program, I don't know how many times I've heard about somebody who comes out who gets the job and a week later they're fired or they quit because they didn't have transportation. And in the city of Detroit, if you can't get to a job, you're not working. Um, I, the transportation's a whole other separate thing that we don't need to get into. Um, so I think just broad strokes, engaging with them prior to release to assess what the needs are, engaging with employers to understand what their needs are, and then bridging that gap with training programs, with soft skill programs, and then post-release supports around employment, around um, the reintegration into the community, so that's uh, family connections, if that is ongoing substance abuse uh, interventions or uh, other sorts of mental health interventions. All those things uh, are crucial. Um, and if anybody has the magic recipe, please let me know. One of the really important pieces of this is the pre-employment soft skills, as we refer to it here. Um, I'm the PCAP trainer along with the PCAP team, which is staff and faculty. And so on any given year, we train about 150 or 160 students, graduate students, undergrad and um, graduate, and volunteers from the community to work in workshops. And we go into prisons all over the state um, to curate the art, but we also work in a number of prisons and places like um, youth facilities and urban high schools, um, residential placement settings, um, to do PCAP workshops in the community. And of that effort, the most critical thing that I think we don't even think about is how important it is to work with folks that are in cages, that are locked up, that are suffering, that have had addiction issues, that have had problems with socialization, with um, you know, getting along with their families, with um, hurting their families. So the workshops that we do with theater and with music and with creative writing especially, with, um, you know, with all of the uh, bag of tricks that PCAPS uses, we help that community heal and be able to relate to one another. So if we go in and I've got, we've got 15 students and, um, you know, f of the volunteers in the facility, um, that are participating and we bring in two or three students and we work together to work out a play or to work out creative writing, write about your favorite childhood memory and share it. Um, those are the types of things that build community and build the capacity to be able to relate to one another, to respect one another, to be somewhere on time, to learn what it is to come out of that cage, to come out of the situation that you are and try to you know, get your act together and um, be able to learn communication skills to come home with. And so prisoners not only communicate to us through their paintings and through their art, which is nonverbal, but they communicate in writing with the, um, their writing that is submitted to the Creative Writing Journal. Um, they communicate it to us, especially within the women's facility, what's happening with them when we're in the workshop. And those are the types of things that help you be able to understand what's going on on the other side of the fence, because your communication with the world usually is some guard walking in every day and the television, you know, and we know how bad that can be right now. So the, um, the soft skills piece of this is really critical and I think that um, that's the importance of arts in facilities and in prisons and lockups. It's that ability to be able to um, help folks with their identity, with their reentry, and with just dealing with the pain and the grief that is the life of a prisoner.
Um, so to give the youth justice uh, perspective, um, as John mentioned earlier on the earlier panel, I um, am the coordinator of the Raise the Age campaign here in Michigan to raise the age of juvenile jurisdiction uh, from 17 to 18. We're one of the only five states that still automatically prosecutes all 17-year-olds as adults. Um, and it's important to consider that 17-year-olds um, and young people under the age of 18 that are sentenced to adult prisons, most of them eventually get out. Most of them eventually come home. And prisoner reentry is going to look very different for them than someone who was an adult on the outside before they ever entered the system in the first place. These are kids who really struggled, or young adults now, or adults now, that really never had an opportunity to be employed, let alone sign checks, obtain an apartment on their own. So. Uh, to the most extent possible, prison reentry has to be individualized to be able to cater to specific populations like that. And um, for young people, which I'm more uh, familiar with that are in juvenile residential facilities, youth employment is important for them too. So making sure that there is workforce development options for them as they return back home to their communities, to their families, making sure that uh, academic uh, their, their school credits are easily transferred back from home and they're able to reestablish uh, some sort of school program to further their education. All of that is important for young people uh, returning home from juvenile facilities as well. Um, I think it's really difficult to address this um, question in isolation as if it's, it doesn't exist in, a, in an entire context that, you know, criminalizes um, communities. So like just, just taking Detroit, for instance, 40% of the MDOC population is from Wayne County. And in Detroit, 57% of young people come from impoverished backgrounds. 40% of the general population is earning $26,000 a year or less. Now, when we look at Department of Labor statistics, um, the average household in Michigan is spending about 58 k just to survive. So, like, assuming that the folks in Detroit don't need, like, entertainment budgets, right, or health care or, you know, like, extra stuff like that assuming that they only needed transportation to get to and from work, food, and housing, those categories, according to this Department of Labor research, adds up to about 34K. So I think we need to ask ourselves what folks are doing to fill in that gap on such a regular basis. Um, and, you know, I think, so if we answer this question in a, in a sort of short-term, speedy way, we need to vote in impacted people that will um, create budgets for things like restorative justice, entrepreneurship, things like that, because those things should be in our budgets, right? Like, we should value our people enough to solve these problems with public budgets. Um, but I think, you know, there is another, um, you know, some more holistic line of thinking that would beg the question whether or not um, employment is an, a culturally appropriate sort of option for a whole constituency that has been, you know, chronically unemployed for so long. Like, do we invest in entrepreneurship and provide uh, sort of like clerical support so that we can and, and support with uh, getting clients and 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 training for for things like that like folks are hustling y'all what are, are we not you know they're not making twenty six thousand dollars a year right they're hustling they're making their life happen and is there a way to sort of legitimize those streams of income um, so that we can ensure that they are um, building the right types of hustles <laughs> and, and strengthen them so that they become more like businesses so that they don't have to make a choice for how to you know, meet the needs of transportation, food, and housing? Um, I, 
I wanted to just echo that. Uh, you know, one of the one of the most startling things to look at this nationally is that you know, ten years ago, nobody was really talking about reforming the criminal justice system, and then there was a lot of momentum to do that. But that that conversation has been so isolated from the conversation about. Uh, the, the broader questions of what gets us into this mess in the first place, questions of economic injustice in cities like Detroit and every city in the country, and educational injustice, and all of those questions. And, and I, you know, it's really easy to say, um, you know, of course it's all connected, of course we need to be holistic, but, but it needs to really be, I think, the position that people working in the justice system start to take uh, just very overtly, very loudly, because what's happening at the state legislative level is that state legislators are, some of them, and even at the city level, are coming on board with the idea that we need re-entry, or coming on board with the idea that we need to roll back mandatory minimums, or coming on board with the idea that we need more money for drug treatment. But where it all seems to fall apart is coming on board for a $15 minimum wage, uh, coming on board to actually fund the school system, which is, of course, why teachers today are shutting down the Oklahoma State House. And the fact that criminal justice reform movement, the, that movement is so divorced from other grassroots movements for economic justice and educational justice is a serious problem. And I think it's one that I think criminal justice folks need to really make the overture and say, look, you know, we well recognize that we could fix all this tomorrow. We could have every law change. We could have every, we could have reentry made perfect, perfect tomorrow, with enough goodwill. But that's not going to stop uh, the fact that you know that people don't have jobs before they ever got in, which is why, uh, in many cases, why they were criminalized in the first place to get in. So I know I'm stating the obvious, but I hope what I'm adding to it is to say that um, I think we're at a really important turning point in these criminal justice reform discussions and it's just imperative that we start to link up with these other questions of economic justice, which has not really happened, frankly, um, nationally or enough locally. Just to throw in one other thing, I'm glad you brought up the issue of uh, poverty. Um, from a, When we look at the workforce system, uh, in post Great Recession, with the passage of the stimulus package, the focus of the workforce system was to help businesses stay in business and to help re-employ individuals who were laid off. So for instance, um, the workforce system would be really a great fit for you if you were a GM worker who was laid off, came in, we put you in a nursing training program, and then you got a job at the Detroit Medical Center. You had a long history of employment. You, were, you, were, you had a stable lifestyle, you had family that you could rely on, you might have had a savings, you, you, had, you had a lot of the things that the population that we are now trying to serve did not have. And the legacy of that are a lot of assumptions that the workforce system and the individuals and the organizations that comprise it bring to the table when we're serving individuals who are living in poverty or individuals who lived in poverty, were incarcerated, and are coming back to the same situation that they left 10, 15, however many years ago. And so the the way that a workforce system moves somebody out of poverty into self-sufficiency is going to be much different than the way you, you help somebody who's been temporarily laid off or who's been laid off, but it, it's been you know, just a couple of weeks. Um, and so that, I think, is still something that a lot of communities are struggling with. In Detroit, that problem is only magnified by the number and the uh, percentage of individuals and households living in poverty. Um, so thanks for bringing up that issue because it, it's, it's something that it's, it's very easy to, to overlook despite the the uh, best intentions of, other, of everybody at the table. Jumping to another enormous topic, I wanted to ask you all about sentencing reform. Uh, what is the most urgent set of needs in sentencing reform in Michigan today, and how might we think differently about what we're doing already to approach those efforts? I think that we're in the middle of a crisis of major proportions. The day before the election, crime rates were dropping, prison bed rates were dropping, people were being released that should have been released years ago, years and years ago. The efforts of returning people to help in the movement against mass incarceration was booming. 
After the election, like the next day, everything that was privatized about prison that they could possibly ramp back up, they started with. We now have a political situation in this country with private prisons and with the disaster that Trump and Jeff Sessions have wrought upon us, and we have to figure out what is our response to this. I mean, as a community that is an arts community and educators and activists and wise people, this is the wise, this is the intelligentsia right here, we're the think tank, what are we going to do? They're trying to eliminate arts and humanities. They're trying to put everybody they can possibly grab a hold of to shove into a private prison cell indefinitely with no due process rights. And the criminalization of everything now is, I mean, the poor woman that voted when she got out, now they're giving her five years for voting. What's that all about? I mean, we have a real crisis here, and my hope in our efforts and in the efforts of the forums to come is that we address that. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Um, I think one of the most powerful things I heard today was narrative change. There's power in words. There's power in that art. There's power in prisoner writing. They are communicating to us what is happening with them, and we need to respond to what's happening both to the political climate and to, and to our own movement. What do we do next? That's a real challenge right now. Yes, <laughs> right on to that. Um, I was going to say specifically about sentencing reform, I think this, because it's such a crisis and because, um, because we're trying to figure out how to get back some of that momentum and energy prior to the last election, I think it's an, uh, and also an opportunity for us to think about where exactly we were headed right before that election with regard to, for example, sentencing reform. And I just want to say that I think that this is a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's nothing but a great news story. We're talking about rolling back mandatory minimums. We're talking about uh, you know diversion programs. We're talking about reducing sentencing overall. And you know what could be wrong with that? Well, nothing except for the fact that, again, while nobody's paying attention, and because of privatization, there is simultaneously going on this attempt to, to keep all of those same people still in the system through other means. So tethering is one of the you know, obvious ones of those, but certainly not the only one. And so again, I worry, I'm not to, I feel like I'm putting all the flies in the ointment here, but yeah, so tethering when you, you do get out, but you actually have an ankle monitor, you, have a, you, you are still in effect under correctional control even though you're in your own home. And, you know, for many criminal justice reform folks, that just sounds like, well, okay, that's so much better than being in a criminal cell. And I mean, I, that's hard, or criminal cell, prison cell. It's hard to argue with. But again, it's one of these giving with one hand, taking away with the other. And if we're not careful in the system, if we keep trying to solve this through the system, that is the criminal justice system, trying to solve social problems through the criminal justice system, we just get a different version of the criminal justice system. So sentencing reform, you can't, there's nothing to argue against. It, we should do it right on, I'll sign every bill, you know, yes. But at the same time, we are not in fact decarcerating. We are still keeping people under correctional control. You still can't have a job if you're on a tether. You still can't have freedom of movement. You still can't go to school if your school is less than whatever, 20 miles away from your house. So I'm just using the example of electronic monitoring or tethering, but there are many examples like this. So I think, again, sentencing reform becomes this panacea that we have to just say yes, but be very, very cautious about what's going on underneath that. And privatization is the key, because when I was in DC in 2012, and, we, and I, could, I, just, I can tell you, state or, I'm sorry, federal legislators were saying, what are we going to do? Our lobbyists, man, they, they want private prisons, and now we're going to decarcerate. What can, we, you know, what can we tell them? How can we sell them on this? And the answer was privatized reentry. Um, you know, there's a lot of money. If we, if we, get, if we bring home two and a half million people, there's going to be a hell of a lot of money to be made in doing that and in still connecting them to the system. And I mean, I heard it from the mouth of the, the beast. And so, uh, yes, but cautiously.
Thank you. I think the other, um, one of the other pieces of thinking about sentencing reform in Michigan is the resentencing of all the juvenile lifers. So Michigan used to have the option of sentencing children to life without parole, and it was in fact a, a mandatory sentence for certain crimes. And the, when the US Supreme Court ruled in the Miller decision that we couldn't do that to people anymore, then we had over 360 juvenile lifers who are now adults in the state of Michigan who uh, ought to be resentenced, and our attorney general fought against that and said, no, we're not going to do this, and then it took another U.S. Supreme Court decision to force states like Michigan and Pennsylvania and others to go back and give a resentencing option of some kind to the juvenile lifers, but again, our state attorney general said, well, let's resentence them all to life without parole again. So the um, some of these measures about sentence that we sort of lump into conversations about sentencing reform aren't reforms at all. It's just an opportunity for us to say the same thing again. I think only around 10 or a dozen juvenile lifers in Michigan have been resentenced to the point where they could actually come home. And that, that seems to me uh, a subject matter well worthy of our, our time and attention as we think about sentencing as well. Um, also, there is a boom in the state around um, marijuana, and there are people serving sentences for marijuana at the same time. So the folks, you know, benefiting from marijuana and those sales are one color, and the folks in prison, you know, are another color. Um, and that is just, you know, dead on accurate. Um, there is a problem also with mandatory minimums. So I don't know how many of you all have heard about Sawatu Salamara's story. Um, I'm a part of her freedom team. Uh, without taking up too much time, Sawatu was a long-term freedom fighter. She was attacked by another person. Um, she brandished her weapon. Um, that was legal and unloaded to, to get the assailant away from her and her family. And she is in jail right now, 25 year old Muslim woman activist, seven months pregnant, in jail um, and, and being treated horribly, right? She's, um, she's not being given an, an adequate amount of water, so she's had these infections. Her pregnancy is high risk. When she was at the doctor trying to navigate those infections, she was shackled. The doctor asked them to release her. She's in pain. We're trying to treat her. They wouldn't. Um, there, there's all this, you know, there's all this stuff. Uh, she's facing that sentence because, um, because she was tried by jury and they found her guilty of felonious assault, and that came with a mandatory felony firearm sentence of two years. So now this woman, this 25-year-old woman, who's been doing justice work since she was 14, is in our system, suffering as a pregnant woman. Um, Freesawatu.org, you can donate to the campaign, you can you know, help us organize, um, help us get her pardoned, whatever help you can present, I will appreciate that. Thank you so much for making us aware of that case, and it's the perfect segue into the last thing that I wanted to ask you all about today, which is what are the most pressing needs and concerns of women and youth in the correctional system in Michigan today? When the Detroit House of Corrections closed August 5th of 1977, 158 women were chained together, um, bus load by bus load, and transferred to the new Huron Valley Women's Facility. I was one of the last ones on the bus. That same grounds, the penitentiary, which they've renamed twice, but it's the same penitentiary, um, now holds over 2,200 women. They are packed to the gills. There are cubicles with six and eight. There are areas where everybody's just, you're like sardines in a can. You can't, 
you can't get a bathroom, you can't get health care, you can't get a job, you can't, you cannot exist. You can't survive the flu sometimes, it's so treacherous. Um, the overcrowding and mass incarceration is the most serious human and civil rights crisis, I think, of my lifetime. I watched it grow from, you know, yard with five or six people until right before I left, right before I was commuted. I sat in the yard one day and I looked around and I thought, oh my God, this looks like the United Nations in here. I mean, it was, everybody was in there. It was packed. And I think the overcrowding situation is true everywhere that I've experienced from the facilities where we work and from the communication that we've received from our participants and from our artists. And I think that this is a very noble effort here in attempts to do something about mass incarceration because people are dying. They're committing suicide in record rates. And I've noticed that across the country, article after article after article about folks committing suicide. You just can't take it. Because if you weren't mentally ill when you arrive, you certainly will be by the time they take you through all that stress and pressure with the poor diet, with the poor um, no, no bleach, with, you know, with the poor unsanitary conditions that are our prisons today. And so I, along with the challenge to, to figure out what are we going to do post-Trump, we also have to really seriously consider how are we going to deal with the human rights abuses that are happening every day as an artist community, as a community of educators, um, and what, it, what can we do to relieve some of that terrible, terrible suffering? And in the juvenile system as well. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely staggering, particularly in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania that have more juvenile lifers than anywhere, but actually even in the short-term facilities that we know well here in Michigan, the conditions are just, I mean, you, you just, you, you can't even quite believe it. And you can't quite believe that day in and day out, these kids, there's no transparency, there's no oversight, and this is even in the best institutions, because once the doors lock, the only people inside are the people that are working there that need to keep their jobs, and the kids who don't have a voice. I mean, if they had, usually if they had strong parental uh, relationships, those are broken down because of lack of visitation and everything. So they can't tell you what's going on. The lack of transparency issue overall is I want, think that one that we can maybe get more people on board. I mean, I always, t I always say to people, there is no other public institution that the American public supports and gives its money to that has a 78% failure rate unquestioningly gives our money to, unquestioningly gives our support to. Um, can you imagine, I mean, if the school rate had a 78% failure rate, we would, you know, we'd withdraw all money and shut down the public school system. Oh wait, that's what we're doing. Um, with prisons, and I say 78%, that's by their own measure, right? Recidivism, that means that they're not doing what they're supposed to do by their own measure, and we just keep funding them with no view on the inside, no transparency, our state senators can't just walk in anytime they want, parents can't walk in to see what's happening to their children, and, you know, with the juveniles, that's particularly a problem because they don't even have someone on the outside who, to whom they can report this. So I uh, apologize for being a, a one-trick pony, but um, I think that we really need to remove young people under the age of 18 from adult jails and prisons. Those facilities are, are not designed for them. Um, the research is clear that they're more likely to uh, face physical harm, uh, commit suicide, reoffend when they return home, compared to young people that are kept in the juvenile justice system and those facilities, even though they're not perfect either. Um, they're not safe to be there. And here in Michigan, um, the, the counties and their jails who do try to comply with uh, the federal guidelines for the Prison Rape and Elimination Act that requires uh, young people under the age for 18 to be separated sight and sound from adults, many of uh, the county sheriffs will admit that the only way that they're able to do that is by housing that 17-year-old or the 16-year-old if they're transferred to the adult system based on their crime. Uh, the only way they're able to do that and comply with that is by putting them in solitary confinement, which only exacerbates mental health issues and puts them at greater risk. So many sheriffs uh, have admitted that it's impossible to the uh, sight and sound separate, so they just mix them up. Um, it's something that has to happen. We, uh, we talked about workforce development earlier. 
we're putting 17-year-olds here in Michigan because of all the rest of the country has been able to figure this out and serve 17-year-olds in their juvenile justice system in a competitive disadvantage. 17-year-olds uh, or youth under the age of 18 that are served in the JJ system, they don't necessarily have to report on job applications that they've been convicted of a felony because an adjudication is different. So right now, a 17-year-old who commits a, a crime similar to a 17-year-old here in Michigan from Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, Canada, places like that have a, a, a competitive advantage than a kid in Michigan, applying for jobs here in Michigan, applying to the University of Michigan. So it's something that, um, you know, sentencing reform, prison reform is going to be an ongoing battle, but we have to take the kids off the battlefield. We have to take uh, young people out of these facilities that were never designed for them in the first place. Um, I'm just going to share really quickly, um, because I think everybody else did a great um, job answering the question. I'm just going to share two concrete examples of this. Um, in the Huron Valley facility, there was a woman who had a seizure for three days. The guards thought she was exaggerating, or this is what she said, or this is what they said, rather. This woman died. Um, so, you know, and then, and then there are women in this facility who give birth in shackles. I mean, we would not stand to see a dog give birth in shackles in this country. You know, not a guinea pig, not, you know, not a wild animal that we didn't want to mess with. We would not stand to see it. Human rights activists would rise up everywhere about that dog shackled, giving birth. Um, so we have to see our, our people as human. And so, you know, I'm an, I'm an artist. My father was incarcerated, I told you, for 27 years. I didn't share that he was in the PCAP program. And um, I, was, I was a poet. That was one of my first jobs, Vanguard Community Center, teaching performance poetry to other younger people than I was, but I was actually quite young myself. And um, because of his you know, training in PCAP, he was able to write poetry with me. So we would go back and forth in letters, and he would edit poems, he would start short stories, I would finish them. Um, it was like, we had this relationship through language. So, you know, just shift into um, thinking about how we do our work as artists, right? We need to figure out ways to center impacted voices in, um, in, in the sharing of these stories, in the sharing of these visuals, and that means creating some really, really unique partnerships um, where impacted people benefit financially, not just, you know, um, not just as somebody who gives their story to sort of this grandiose vision for justice, but they're a real stakeholder um, and we need to begin to, to let the world know what these experiences are like and use these, um, these stories, these visuals, the things that emerge from these unique partnerships as the call to action for justice. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, to speak a little bit more to Alia's beautiful story about uh, sharing the work with your father. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. We at PCAP hear a lot from the artists inside and we don't as often hear the kinds of stories that you just shared about the impact on children and families and that is very meaningful to us. One of the ways that we at PCAP try to make sure that artists do financially benefit from our programming is that the show you'll see tonight, if you come with us to the Duderstadt Gallery for the closing reception of both this event and our 23rd annual exhibition of art by Michigan prisoners, uh, you will find in that gallery 658 works of art by currently incarcerated artists and by at least one person who's in this room who's come home since, uh, since he contributed art to the show. So I'm gonna embarrass Martin Vargas in the back there. He. Yes, big round of applause. Uh, 
Martin has the distinction of being one of, I believe, only five people to have contributed to our exhibition all 23 years that we've been doing it. And it is uh, an immense honor and joy to have him home with us again now. Um, but what I started to say was that when you choose to buy a piece of art from our exhibition, we do add taxes to whatever price the artist has named for that piece. So if somebody makes a painting and she says she wants $50 for this painting, if you as a patron decide to buy that, you'll pay 60 something, I think, whatever the, the percentage of tax that goes on top, the part, 6% sales tax. And, but then there's another tax from the inmate benefit fund in the Michigan Department of Corrections. So the prison takes a tax and the state takes a sales tax. We charge both of those on top of whatever price the artist has asked for so that if that painting sells, the woman who made it or the man who made it will receive $50 in his or her inmate account, whatever price he or she asked for the work of art. So um, we've heard many times over the years that that money from the art sales is the only way that people inside are able to continue to buy art supplies and make art because as much as we would love to, we are not allowed in most cases to bring art supplies inside to the people who are, are making art. So these, these financial supports are real and necessary. People should not be having to give away their life experiences without whatever kind of, of um, compensation that we are able to give them. So this pretty much wraps up our, uh, our time together, but I thought before we close that I would ask um, the panelists if there are any remaining thoughts, anything that you really wanted this beautiful crowd of people to know about your programming or your work or issues that are really uh, chief in your minds and hearts today before we close out the panel. Is this the mic? Yeah. <laughs> um, so please go to uh, the Raise the Age campaign website, raisetheagemi.org. It, it lists the uh, current legislation that's up in the uh, House Law and Justice Committee. Hopefully we'll have a hearing soon. We need your help to push legislators to have a hearing on these bills to remove youth from the adult system as much as possible. Um, and then there's also, uh, you can sign up for a newsletter so you can get updates on the campaign and action alerts, and then also see ways that you can, more ways you can be involved. So www.raisetheagemi.org. Um, I mentioned the website earlier. I neglected to spell Sawatu's name. So it's uh, free. Sawatu is S-I-W-A-T-U dot org. PCAP's registration link is live, so if you're interested in volunteering with PCAP or if you'd like to do a workshop and let us train you, uh, please register. You can uh, check, it out, check us out on our website. And also the National Prison Arts Coalition is here today representing, and um, also check them out. That's a wonderful masterpiece of work that has programming all across um, the United States and some international work. And, um, we, they're our dear friends. So, uh, Wendy. Wendy, That's yay. Wendy from the Prison Wendy. Arts Coalition. Thank you, Wendy. Um, this might be a little this is going to be very much in line with my approach as being a very boring person who focuses on systems and programs as opposed to the very creative side, which uh, I'm not eloquent enough to praise. But um, the Michigan State Legislature recently passed a bill of packages eliminating driver's responsibility fees, uh, which we discovered uh, faced or imposed um, a barrier to employment on about 75% of the individuals in our program. Overall, we dug into the numbers, it's about 20% uh, of Detroit's working age adult population uh, faced fees averaging $1,600 to getting a driver's license. Uh, in many cases, uh, individuals who didn't have a driver's license still drove, and you can imagine what happens if you do that and you're on parole or probation. Um, so the, just like everything that the state government tends to do, it's going to be kind of complicated to get your license back if you're facing one of these 
one of these fees, but we are in the process of coming out with a communications package and communications strategy. And all I ask is that you spread the word because similar to expungements, there's going to be amount of um, skepticism. There's going to be uh, some bureaucratic barriers to overcome. There's going to be a cost associated with it, which if you are under certain levels of, of income, the, the city has resources to assist with, the public workforce system has resources to assist with. So if you're in a position, please spread the word. If you know individuals, you know organizations that serve individuals who would face this barrier, please spread the word because um, if you can't move, you can't work, you can't live. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end on the bureaucratic note that I started. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Please give a big round of applause to our panelists.